I was uh, sitting on my rocking chair this last week in my Christmas PJs eating a bag of Oreos. And you ever watch a TV show and you fall asleep halfway through and you wake up, there's something totally different online or on, on the TV? So that happened to me and I woke up and there was this televangelist, he's a TV evangelist, that's what they mean, uh, online and he's preaching. And so I still have, you know, some Oreos, and I decide to continue eating my Oreos. And uh, he, he says, have you ever struggled with life? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I've struggled with life. Have you struggled with life? Life is tough. And, uh, and, and, you know, he's speaking to the camera, so I feel like he's kind of looking right at me as I'm sitting there in my PJs eating Oreos. And he says, have you ever walked in sins of the flesh? I'm like, this guy is good. I mean, he is, he's nailing it down. He says, are you sitting on a rocking chair and your Christmas PJs eating Oreos? And I'm like, yes, sir. He's talking to me. He said, do you have the urge to send me $1,000? And I said, close. Man, kind of wiped the sweat off my forehead. Said, I thought he was talking about me there for a second. <laughs> That's exactly how the people of 1 John probably reacted after they read the first part of the message. It was like, wow. I thought, I thought John was talking about me there for a second because, man, he was preaching some really tough stuff. If you don't obey God, you're not really an authentic Christian. And so we want to strive to obey God. We're imperfect people trying to follow a perfect Lord and Savior. And so what, Paul, what John's going to do here is he's going to affirm the church. Look, we should be following God. There should be a pattern about our lifestyle. But I don't want you to forget that you are saved and that God loves you and that you know God, and that God is not just going to throw you out just because you make mistakes. And so if you have your Bibles, like I said, we're going to be in 1 John chapter 2. I'd like for you to read along with me in verses 12 through 14. John says this, I'm writing to you, little children, and this is a term of endearment, because your sins have been forgiven. Man, that's good news. After the previous passages of Scripture, and then you hear, hey, look, I want to remind you, I want to put this in perspective. Your sins have been forgiven. He goes on to say this, I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I have written to you, children, because you know the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. You see, in other words, John is saying, let me remind you of what is also emphatically true. Now, these words, little children, father, uh, young men, they can be interpreted a few different ways. Number one, you can interpret them literally as if he's only writing to little children and older men and younger men. Whereas another school of thought, which is probably more accurate, is he's writing to different people at different uh, spots in their journey. Right? Different spiritual maturity levels. And so there are some people who are children in the faith. They've just been recently coming to church. They don't really know a whole lot about this gospel thing. But hey, they are followers of Jesus. And what does John say about them? Look, let me remind you, even if you don't have it all together, even if you're not walking in perfect obedience, but you're trying to be, remember your sins are forgiven. And then he addresses what's young men. These are people kind of in the middle age of Christianity. They're not new converts, but they're, they're not those uh, older, spiritually mature, just unshakable people. And so he says to you younger men, or to those of you who have been in the faith for some quite time, I want you to know that I am proud of you because you have overcome the evil one, and you are strong. And the word of God abides in you. And then he uses this word father. Father refers to those who have been there for a long time. Now John is writing to the church that's in Ephesus, or church is. And this is an established church. And so we're talking about 40 years since the gospel was first preached. 40 years in the church is quite some time. And for those of you who have been in the church for 40 years and you've studied the word of God, you should be the most spiritually mature. I could be a Christian starting at 13 and I could be 53 years old, and I should be spiritually mature. Or say I came into the church when I was 40 years old, and now I'm in my 80s. I should be spiritually mature. So we're not talking about those of you who are just at a higher level in your age. We're talking about those who are at a higher level in your spiritual maturity. And so he uses the word father. Now let's break this down a little bit. Despite having his tough theology, John recognizes and affirms that his readers have been living their Christian lives well. They've been living in the light. And I think that we all need that assurance. 
Look, when we come to church, if we're going to be authentic Christians, we have to deal with this idea and this reality that we make mistakes and we fall short of the glory of God, while at the same time being assured of God's love for us and his salvation to us. It's like being in a husband and wife relationship. And I think those of you who have been married the longest, you can definitely identify with this, right? You love your spouse. You are committed to being their spouse. You affirm them, and your love for them doesn't change. But that doesn't mean they're perfect and that they don't make mistakes. It doesn't mean that if you've been married for 40 years, you still don't have things that you need to work through and work on. And so we have to have this balance in the church, especially our relationship and our lives with God. We must deal with our sin and the areas where we fall short, while at the same time being assured of God's love for us. Your sins have been forgiven. You are overcoming the evil one. You do know God. And so that's what John is trying to bring forth here. Now in this idea of rejecting worldliness, this is really what our sermon's going to be all about this morning. What is an authentic Christian? An authentic Christian is somebody who rejects worldliness. How do we reject worldliness? Well, we do that in two ways. We stick with the same gospel and we stay on the same moral path of our behavior. How do we reject worldliness? We stick with the same gospel and we stay on the same path with our moral obedience. And so that's, that's where we're going to be going this morning. And so I'd like for you to look with me at verse 12. Notice what he says. I am writing these things to you. Why? Because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I think this is one of the building blocks of Christianity, and this is something that we always need to remind ourselves, because I don't know if you struggle with this sometimes, that I tend to struggle with this idea that if I don't measure up, if I don't act a certain way, if I don't perform certain good deeds, and especially if I struggle with certain sins, I almost feel like I'm an unsaved person. I feel like God doesn't love me, I've disappointed him, I'm somehow saved by what I do, and so my emotions get the best of me. Have you ever felt like you're not saved? I know that I have. But here's the good news. We're not saved for our name's sake. We're not saved by what God does in us. We're saved by what God did for us on the cross 2,000 years ago. We're saved for his name's sake. And this is the building block of Christianity is that we are saved by God's grace. And this is what John reminds his readers. Over the last few weeks, we've been talking about this term, this group of people called Gnostics. They believed that they could attain spiritual uh, perfection through their special knowledge, and that they didn't sin, and that they were the only ones who were truly knowing God. And John comes along and he says, oh no, that's not what knowing God looks like. It's not about special knowledge. It's about how you live your life. It's not about who you claim to know. It's what you claim to know. They denied the deity of Jesus. They didn't believe that he was God in the flesh. They denied that the things that you actually did were sinful. And they added this mystical special knowledge that you had to attain in order to become perfect. And John comes along and he says this, perfection is not attained through your own works. Perfection is attained through what Jesus did for us on the cross. And sometimes that's tough, accepting God's grace. Because we live in a society where you need to prove yourself. You need to earn your keep. You need to show how much you're worth. And so whether you show your body on social media or you climb the ladder at your home office or, or, or your, your job or you have the biggest home that you could ever imagine, when we can attain that, we have finally reached perfection. And John says the only way that we reach, we reach perfection is through Jesus Christ. And so that's, that's something that we need to assure ourselves. It's because of Jesus that we are saved. Look what he says in verse 13. He says, I'm writing to you, you fathers, because you know the Father. Your relationship with God is actually genuine. And that is so encouraging to me, to know that if I recognize and renounce my sin, if I'm having a pattern of obedience to God, I can clearly know that I am in a knowing relationship with God. You don't have to wonder. It's not based off of how you feel. It's based off what is obvious and what is true. And man, is it a good thing to be reminded that you know God. Your knowledge of God is authentic. Look what he says to the young men, those who are in the middle age range of their Christianity. He says, you have overcome the evil one. You know, I think our culture doesn't like there to be a devil. Maybe even ourselves, we don't like the idea of there being a devil because we have this idea of a little guy in a red suit with a long tail and horns running around trying to make bad things happen to us. But that's not who Satan is. That's not who the evil one is. He's a principality. He's a power. He's a spiritual force. 
He's a person that's immaterial. He doesn't have horns. He's not easily recognized. He lays traps for us at every moment in our life. It usually happens when we're exhausted, we're overstressed, we've been personally attacked, and things just aren't going well. And he lays this little trap, and we explode over something that typically doesn't even matter. He gets little footholds in our life. He says, yeah, you're entitled to feel this way. Yeah, you deserve this. Yeah, you should think this way. Yes, this is, this is why you are so wronged and why you're at such a disadvantage and why you're right and everyone else is wrong. And he sneaks his little theology in there and he starts changing how we feel. He starts changing how we think and then he starts changing what we believe. And it always starts with the small things. He is an adversary. He is an evil one. To deny his reality is to already lose the battle. And we've got to be aware We've got to think and put our minds engaged and say, man, look, what is our adversary trying to do against us? But look at the encouragement. Look at what he says. You have overcome the evil one. Well, how did they do this? Well, look what also he says to the young men. He says, you are strong. You have the ability to withstand. How do you have the ability to withstand? Because you have knowledge of God. One of the most important things that you can do to overcome the evil one is to read your Bible to get knowledge of God in your mind so that you can recognize areas of your own weakness and areas of where you may be attacked. You can look at the schemes, and it's so interesting. The more I study the Bible, the more aware I am of the schemes of Satan. It is so absolutely true, and it becomes so obvious. But when you're not in the Word, you're just almost spiritually blind. You're oblivious to what actually is going on. And so you have a blow up with your spouse, Nine times out of ten, it's over something that's really small. You have a blow up at your job. Nine times out of ten, it's just been leading up and finally you explode. You have these moments of weakness where you've been caught off guard. Uh, For those of you, for instance, who struggle with the sin of sexual morality, it usually happens when you're alone and you're exhausted and you've been overworked. That's nine times out of ten, that's when it happens. When you have a fight with your spouse, nine times out of ten, you're exhausted, you're overworked, and you've been personally attacked we got to become aware. we got to look at the big picture. we got to see what is it that the evil one wants me to do. And here's what he wants you to do. He wants you to not stick with the same gospel, and he wants you to not stay on the same path. Those are the two things that he wants to get you to do. And that's exactly what's going on in 1 John. You see, we need to be able to be strong in the Lord. I like what Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 6. He says, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. How do you be strong in the Lord? Equip yourself with his knowledge. This is what Paul wrote to Timothy, who was a young man um, in the church, not necessarily in the faith. And he was being looked down upon by people in his congregation because of his youth. But the guy knew the word. The guy preached the word, and he was on fire for Jesus. Yet Paul had to remind Timothy. He says, you, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Jesus Christ. It all comes down to what you believe and what perception you have about the reality around you. Let me ask you a question. Who's in control of your emotions? Who's in control of your emotions? It's you. So I could come up and call you a name. I could come up and do something evil to you. But how you react is not dependent on what I do. It's dependent on what you do. And so it all comes down with how you perceive the reality around you. It's not about what people say to you and do to you. It's about what you believe is true and right. Jesus was willing to be insulted and crucified and spit upon, and yet the man never took revenge. He never repaid insult for insult. He never repaid evil for evil. He willfully allowed himself to be subject to the cross because he was in control, not the people around him. And there is nothing more freeing than finally being in control. Man, maybe marriage stinks sometimes, and you feel like your spouse is controlling you. No, you're in control of yourself. Maybe church life is tough. And you feel like the people around you are controlling you. No, you're in control of you. And that's what what John's reminding of them. He's saying you're strong. Aristotle put it like this. It is the mark of an educated man or an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. And we live in a day and an age where we think that just because I entertain this thought and I think these things and I hear these words, that means that I have to accept it. We need to have the ability to stand strong, whether doctrinally or morally. If people teach or say certain things, we can entertain an idea, but we don't have to accept it. If people come to us and they say mean things to us and they hurt us and they disagree with us, we can entertain those things, 
but we don't have to react to it the way they want us to. We can be in control of us, and that's what the gospel brings. It sets you free from the reactions of the world. It gives you the ability to reject worldliness. That's what John's saying. I want you to leave here this morning being in control of you. Don't let circumstances change who you are in Christ Jesus. Let God's grace transform you. Look what also he goes on to say. He says, you young men are strong and the word of God abides in you. In other words, you don't deny your sin. You renounce it. You recognize it. When it comes to your obedience, you've got a pattern of following God. When it comes to the deity of Jesus, people might say certain things that are false. You have the ability to entertain those thoughts without accepting it. And man, I think this is so true in our culture. All you have to do is turn on the news and you get another different idea, another different perspective, whether it's politics or religion or philosophy or morality. And all people want you to say, well, this is my idea. And instead of tolerating it, now it means you have to accept it. You have to endorse it. And if you don't, you're my enemy and you should go to jail. (laughs) I mean, that's basically where our culture is coming to. You either accept and embrace my idea or I'm going to throw something at you, like a rock. Or I'm going to shoot you. Or I'm going to stand up in a restaurant and just yell and scream at you until I get my way. I mean, think about how insane that is. People do it in the church all the time. People do it in religion all the time. And so we have to be strong. How? By the word of God abiding in us. And that's what strong people do. The other day I was sitting in my chair eating Oreos <laughs> and my Christmas PJs. And uh, Angel came up to me and she said, you never listen to me when I talk to you. And I thought, man, that's a really weird way to start off a conversation. You know what I mean? Some of you did not even get that. I am ashamed of you. You didn't get it. You didn't get it. She comes up and she starts off the conversation. Rick, you, you never listen to me. That means she was talking to me before, and I wasn't, all right, I'm sorry I had to explain that one. Man, I thought that was so good. I even bragged about that one to Kyle. I'm like, dude, this is going to be so good. I got like 10 laughs. That's okay. Here's what John says. Look what John says in 1 John chapter 4. He says, we are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Us who? Us apostles. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of deception. So the question is, is who are you listening to? When it comes to your politics, your theology, your morality, your way of life, who are you listening to? Specifically here, John is saying when it comes to the deity of Jesus and when it comes to our moral behavior, who are you listening to? Us apostles or those Gnostics? And I think we have a lot of different people who are enlightened, whether it's financially or theologically or spiritually or organizationally, and we have all of these voices out in the world that are telling us how to live our life, and these ideas may seem great, right? These ideas may seem fantastic, especially when it comes to things like sexual orientation, or biology, or, or anything really that's, that's talked about in our culture. But at the end of the day, Paul, or John says this, you will know an authentic Christian by who they're listening to. How do you reject worldliness and become an authentic Christian? Stick with the same gospel. They're a part of us, John says, because they listen to us. The word of God is the most important thing you can listen to. And so that's what I want to encourage you to do this morning. Listen to the gospel. You see, the only way the word can abide in us is if we're abiding in the word. Are you listening to the apostles? See, you can easily spot somebody who's not living an authentic Christian life because they never read their Bible. They never listen to sermons. Maybe they'll show up one Sunday, uh, one day a week, and they'll hear a message, and they have to listen to somebody like me, right, which isn't a whole lot, (laughs) and then they go home and they live their life. But at the end of the day, are we being authentic? Are we genuinely listening to the Word of God in our lives every single day? You see, people like this, they'll leave the church over non-biblical issues. People who aren't listening to the apostles, they'll leave the church or, or, or Jesus over things that have nothing to do with the Bible. They'll make non-biblical traditions more important than biblical teachings. And we see this in the church all the time, don't we? Don't you even experience this yourself? I would be lying if I were to say that I didn't have the urge to make what I want more important than what God wants. It's true, but thankfully I'm surrounded by people who are able to bring that to attention. And are able to, to, to reflect on the word of God and say, hey, look, what are we really talking about here? Is this what you want or is this what God wants? People who aren't listening to the apostles, they'll get angry when you quote scripture. 
I was talking with a, a gentleman one time. He was very upset about something that I did. And I said, well, hey, let, hey, man, let's just open up the word. He says, don't you give me a Bible lesson. I'm like, dude, take a chill pill, man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, we're not here to get angry. I just want to read the Bible and see what it says. They don't like scripture. They'll teach things contrary to what the Bible teaches. And the Bible calls these kinds of people wolves in sheep's clothing. They look a certain way. But at the end of the day, they don't act the right way. And so John wants us to listen to the gospel. He wants us to overcome the evil one. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 2. Look at how Timothy is overcoming the evil one. Paul writes to him this. The Spirit explicitly says that in latter times, some will fall away from the faith. And look what happens. They'll pay attention to deceitful spirits and the doctrine of demons. By means of hypocrisy of liars, they've seared their own conscience with a branding iron. And man, you've reached a point in your life, Paul says, when you're entertaining things that are from the doctrine of demons and not from God. And this has been never more true than today. Doctrines have evolved, but new doctrines are created all the time. There are thousands of different religions in the world. Now tens of thousands. There are thousands of different political ideologies and belief systems. But at the end of the day, who are you listening to? Where is your foundation? Peter writes this from his perspective. Now there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies that even deny the master, being Jesus, who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. He says, look, there are going to be people who are teaching things that aren't true. And they're going to deny Jesus. And that's exactly what happened in 1 John. They said Jesus wasn't God. He didn't really live in the flesh. He wasn't really crucified. And the word of God isn't really true. You need to listen to our spiritual knowledge. And so we need to be very, very careful. Doctrine does matter. The word of God does matter. And we will always be a church that is built upon the doctrine of Jesus Christ. And we will always be a church that is built on the theology of the New Testament. And we will only allow traditions and ideas in this church that don't conflict with Scripture and only add to our ability to advance the gospel. Those are some pledges that we must hold ourselves to. Doctrine matters. What we believe about the truth really does matter. And so I want us to be on guard. I want us to reject worldliness. I want us to look at these ideologies in the world and say, that's not who or what I follow. I follow Jesus. You see, we not only need to stick with the same gospel, but we need to stay on the same path. I like what Theodore Roosevelt said, to educate a man in mind and not in morals is to educate a menace to society. And so it's not just about what we think, it's about what we do and how we behave. Paul put it like this, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. In other words, sure, yeah, you know a lot of information, but does that information have any effect upon what you do? Yeah, we could sit around and study the Bible all day and say, hey, what should we do? You know, we could do something creative for Jesus. Well, let's have another Bible study, <laughs> right? No, let's go out and do something. That's what was awesome. Look, yesterday I had one of the best days of the year. It was really fun. We came here. We set up for Fall Fest. Several hundreds of people came through here yesterday. Maybe some of you are here from Fall Fest yesterday. And we had a great time. One of the best parts of yesterday for me was this, watching families play with each other. Moms and dads playing with their kids, brothers and sisters shooting basketball. I mean, people just having fun. I got to watch parents' faces light up as their kid. There's like a mix of fear and happiness as their kid's riding on one of those ponies. You know what I mean? Like, are they going to fall? You know, but this is great. And uh, one, of our, one of our members, um, Paul and Sarah Thompson, they posted a picture on, online of their daughter. And she's riding the pony and she's like this. It's like, I'm having fun, but I'm really scared. I mean, it was awesome, man. I mean, just creating an environment for people to, to love on each other and have fun in Jesus name and I got to talk with people about the gospel and about Jesus and invite them to church and it wasn't like let me shove this down your throat it was like hey let's have fun together and let's do this in Jesus name I mean it was great it was awesome and so that's what we should be doing finding ways to live out what we think and what we believe to educate a mind uh, and ideas only without morality as a menace to society we need people who are willing to do something not just think something look what John goes on to say here he says in verse 15, do not love the world, nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, 
It is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. And so here in verse 15, I mean, John doesn't pull any punches, right? He's my kind of guy. When I'm, when I'm having a conversation with somebody, I don't like to beat around the bush, you know, and say, oh, well, it might be this. I am like to say, hey, look, don't love the world or the things of the world because it's not from the Father. We need to love the things of God, not the things of the world. Now, what is love of the world? Well, first of all, we know that it's in, con- uh, it's in direct conflict with the Father, right? You cannot love God and still love the world. But at the same time, we see things like John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? We see that. We also see that when God created the world in Genesis chapter 2, he said it was good. And then when he created man, he said it was very good. So can God love the world, but we can't? What's going on here? Well, let's unpackage this idea just a little bit more. What is John talking about, and what does he mean by world? Well, I think a simple definition can be this. Worldliness is an attitude and a determination to be anchored to a sinful societal mindset which does not know God and is inclined to reject him. So in other words, if you have desires and thoughts and things going on in your life and you've boxed those off with God, right? this is my, this is my world box and this is my God box and I don't mix up the two, that's worldliness. If there are desires that you have that don't include God, that's worldliness. If there are doctrines that you have, teachings that don't include God, that's worldliness. Well, let's think about this a little bit further. Thankfully, John unpackages it a little bit more for us. He's really putting it down like this. Your ideas and your desires, if they don't come from God, where do they come from? And there's only two options. The evil one or your own self. Your own biology, your own theology. Those are the only three options. They come from God, they come from you, or they come from the evil one. Now, how do you know if they come from God? He says the word of God abides in you because you're abiding in the word of God. So let our thoughts and our ideas come from the word and then let our behavior reflect those ideas. He breaks it down in three ways. First of all, He says this in verse 16, for all that is in the world, first of all, lust of the flesh. This is an intense longing or desire that comes naturally from us. Look, we want to eat, right? We're creatures for the most part. We want to have sex. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. Sex is a beautiful thing. It's not a dirty word. In the church, we shouldn't get all scared when SEX comes up, right? It's something that God created and we should embrace and we should celebrate. But how so? With God in the picture. We want to do fun things. We want to have stuff. Look, God wants you to enjoy this life even more than you do. He wants you to enjoy your house and your car and your clothes and your things and your education and your hobbies. God wants you to have fun with that stuff. But how so? With God in the picture. When we isolate God from certain